Hi, everybody. How are you? Hi, Professor. I have a question about the extra credit. Yes. Uh, for the number eight, the answer is uh, very different from the, the quiz. For which one? Number eight on the quiz review? Uh, on the extra credit, the yeah. you know, white shoes and white dress uh, variation. The, that, okay. That question. One second, let me finish. Let me go into quizzes here, let me see. Okay. So for the question, I think the correct answer should be it's 945, but on the extra credit, there's no correct answer. That could be an error. Yeah, I'm looking right now. Give me a second, right? I have so many. Um, let me see. Did you guys? Oh, it's still running. That's why. Okay. Which question, you guy? Which one that you're referring to? Number eight, you said? Yeah, number eight. Okay, let's see. Determine the following geometric sequence. Uh, no, 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 oh, so not that question. Uh, it's the uh, Pamela is at a retail store and wish to buy two pair of white shoes in. Oh, okay, yeah. So interest. Pamela is, okay, so for the shoes. Uh, two pair of white shoes, two white dresses. There are 40 pairs of shoes, 20 dresses, 10. So, okay. How many variations of the white shoes and the white dresses can Pamela buy? Doing Look at something real quick. I wrote this a while back, so let me let me find out. I know I worked this out too, because you you choosing so it's giving you more information about the shoes and the dress, but it comes down to ten pair of shoes that are actually really white. Um, okay, hold on. Yeah, I know. Uh, for for the white shoes, the variation is uh, forty five. Uh, the white dress is twenty one. So times them together, it's mm -hmm. nine forty five. And on extra credit, uh, there's no correct answer. Yeah, there's no options for that, right? Okay. Yes. Yeah, I will fix it after the class today, since it's already six. I will edit that question. 
Yeah, yeah no problem. Yeah. Um, at, yeah. Yeah. Thanks for pointing it out. I think somebody also pointed out last semester. I might have forgotten it afterwards. So, um, yeah. So I'll fix that question. Okay. And even maybe I have to take it off and then edit it and then bring it back on. So I'll see how quizzes, I've never done that before when it's already launched. So I'll see what quizzes will let me do as far as editing it um, while it's launching. And it might have, in Canvas, I can actually do that um, or I have to take it offline and then I have to edit it and then put it back on. So, um, but yeah, I will fix that question for you. Okay, thanks for pointing that out. Okay, all right. So um, let's talk about what we have to do today. So you kind of had a question about the extra credit. There was a question that, that didn't have the correct options there. So I'll revisit that and fix that for you. But we do have an extra credit assignment, which is the quizzes review game. And it does allow you multiple attempts. So if the first time if you do attempt it, um, if you're not happy with your score, you can always go back and reattempt. Um, but yeah, that, there's a question that I need to address. So I'll do that after, right after class, okay? And then we do have a quiz, which is quiz two, that's gonna be due um, on the 26th. Um, so you do have approximately six days. So I usually assign it about seven days when I launch it. So you have your quiz review that was due last week. Um, so you can use that as a study guide, okay? All right, so let's um, go into screen share and then we'll talk about what we have to do as far as induction. And I know that some of your math courses they, that addresses this, um, and then this week, we're going to do a lab on Fibonacci. I got to take a look at my document and make sure that all my accessibility components are there and it's labeled properly. So before I release it, so hopefully I'll get that open tomorrow for you so you can take a look at the program that you have to write. Okay. Uh, hi, Professor. I think the unit nine in class assignment is still unlocked. Uh, nine. Okay. Thank you. Let me see. 22nd. Oh, sorry. I was going through this last night and I, I thought I double check it, but I put the availability date as tomorrow. Sorry about that. Okay. Let's see. Okay. It should, it should update like in a second or so for everybody. And then I will get the lab added. So I must have clicked the wrong date yesterday. Okay, so now it should be available as of today. And then um, it's gonna open until the 23rd. We'll have it due in two days. So you have a little bit of time just to work out the problems, but we're gonna go over the questions today. Okay, let me get my files open also. So I have an upcoming, actually it might not even affect you guys. It, yeah. So next week we'll, we'll, I might have to switch some stuff around a little bit. Um, I originally plan for the next two chapters to be addressed, but there's not a lot of content that we will, because it talks about like finite machines and, and such. So, um, I will take a look at the content and I will plan accordingly. So if we do that unit, um, you might not have to do a lab, but if I move the chapter five, which is the cryptography into that spot, then we can close out we the later weeks with it. So you don't have to worry so much about the lab. Um, so let me see how the schedule is gonna span out for you because I want you to be ready for the project, which there's an option for cryptography. So, and then we'll talk about the project um, maybe after next week or during next week. Um, and then we'll give you the options to work on team or not if you don't wanna work in teams, okay? All right, 
So that's the old one. Let me open my instructor version of this. Okay, so let's talk about um, our unit nine, which is, we have a chapter or a unit on induction. Um, and so it's really a way that we can integrate problem solving and implementing algorithm for the programming side. So you do see some of the, re if you've taken a math class though, but if you haven't, um, it's really a way that we can implement the procedures and those procedures can go into the programming side. As you've seen, our um, recursion program in the past where we implemented all of those as conditional statements. So it's really helpful to kind of write out those steps mathematically and then you can, you know, use that as a kind of sort of like an outline or pseudocode and then to write your program in the preferred language. So to start, um, we're going to hit chapter 12 and 13 today. So we're going to talk about induction and occurrences. And in the lab, we are mainly going to work with a uh, recursion program and we're going to use Fibonacci uh, because, you know, from it's, it's, it's a common number of programming classes. So I want you to see how it's done if you haven't done it before in C++. So that way, if, even if you write it in Java or another language, if you understand the concept, it's really easy, okay? So um, just to define mathematical induction, it's a technique that we would use to prove specific statements about natural numbers. Um, and based on, you know, different circumstances. So, you would see a lot of the programming challenges that would relate to something like Hanoi Tower, right? Some people can write their thesis specifically on that. A lot of the logical puzzles and the games that we see, and we can, we can see that from a programming perspective, it, it really implement mathematical induction. Um, so we want to utilize mathematical math, math statements um, by saying that if, so, if the first case is true, then the, all the following cases must be true. Um, and so we simply use math law to be able to explain that if it's true for one condition, all the following condition uh, or all the following numbers would be true, okay? So, and with that, we can implement the programming side. So you will see some of that incorporated. Um, so in inductive reasoning, it's a method that we can use to reason based on supplying evidence for the truth of the conclusion. Um, and the example that you see here is Gauss trick formula that we've worked on in the lab and also in the last chapter. So if we look at Gauss trick, we know that if n is greater or equal to zero partial sum um, it's on the formula. So we would have n times n plus one divided by two. Now with this, what we can do is we can use the induction to show starting at zero. So that would be your base, right? And what you can do is you can build upon that. So if it's true for zero, then it must be true for k plus her, which is one, and that will be for two and so forth. So what we want to start with is we want to start with an arbitrary n is equal to k, and we want to start with the beginning value, and we want to prove that that value would yield a certain result that would be true, and we can implement the next term, which is k plus one, then be able to establish truth from that point forward everywhere, okay? 
Now the induction would require two steps and you want to follow these two steps. So the first step is to establish the base case. So that way we can prove a given statement, a given math statement for the first natural number. And going back to the last example we used, that was zero. Then the second step would be that we would, which is an inductive step, that we would prove that given statement for any following number, implying the given statement for the next natural number. So if I, you know, naturally we would go from zero going over to one and then two and then three, kind of like what we've been doing by plugging in the n is one, n is two, n is three and so forth. So that way we would show that it would be true for any of the following value, okay? So here um, I, I took this, I snipped this from your textbook and it says if, right? That's, that's, that's what we're trying to show. If P is, is subset of, it's part of natural number, it's some set of the natural number, then our base case is zero is an element of P. And for the second step, the inductive step would be whenever K is an element of P, also k plus one is an element of p. So we would start with zero, zero is an element of p following zero, that would be one. We're trying to prove that one is also an element of p, okay? So we would say that p is part of natural numbers. So therefore, and here I added the table for you to see all the, the um, symbols that we would use to set builder symbols, right? So the step that would consist of these right here, one, two, one through four. Zero is a set because it is a base case. So we would start there. And because of the inductive step, as well as the fact that you have zero, you must also have zero plus one equal to one. Since you, you have one, the inductive step, you must also have two. And since you have two plus a one, then you have a three, three plus a one, then you have a four and accumulate would consist of zero, one, two, three, four, and it could go on. Okay, now in the first example, it shows that when we take P, the set of the values for which the equation is true. So the conditions one and two have shown in the equation is also true. And therefore for all N, okay, now, we don't want to write it out like this, right? We wanted to make it a little, little bit simpler so that way we can quickly go through and we can see condition for if it's true for K, then K plus one should also be true, okay? But this gives you the explanation on how we can go about showing or proving that equation is true for N is zero, when we plug in the zero, and then when we plug in where n is equal to k plus one. So I see that you have some chat information. <laughs> okay. All right, so you wanna start with n is equal to k, and then you want to all also show true for, okay? So when we plug in, in K plus one for this, we show that it is equal to N times N plus one divided by two. 
as if we would substitute for every n, we would plug in k plus one, okay? And then you can simplify that, multiply that out with using distributive law, and then you would come back to that it shows that this is equal to this, okay? All right, so let's take a look at another example, and this is applying to nobody really use stamps anymore. Most of you don't even use stamps, right? Uh, your parents might have, your grandparents, they probably are. Um, so, but back in the day, we would have stamps at a specific cent and in order to mail out like, you know, birthday cards and things, you would put values of specific stamps on the envelope and mail it out. Now they have forever stamps. Where, you know, the post office used to raise the stamp values to get people to buy stamps. Now you can just buy a forever stamp and it works forever, right? Like they don't change the price anymore. And even if they do, that forever stamp would hold the current value. So this will work maybe years ago, maybe a couple years ago, but for now, like you don't see the application for this anymore. But let's say that um, we want to prove that every amount of postage of 12 cents or more can be formed using four cents, five cents stamps. So let's say that we want to equate four and five cent cents to be 12 or higher, okay? When we want to make sure, so you have four cent stamp and five cent stamps and you wanna make it into 12 or higher, okay? So we would take the statement that's required, which is that we have to prove that postage of the N cents can be formed with four five cent stamp. And we know that N needs to start at 12 or higher, okay? So here's our statement. P of N is postage of N cents can be formed using four cents and five cent stamps. Then we're gonna make a claim. We're gonna claim that N is gonna have to be greater and equal to 12. So we're gonna start at 12 and go higher, okay? And in such case, then P of N is true, okay? So this is, we're gonna prove this by using strong induction on N. Now we would start with the base case, that's gonna be step one. We know that we have to start at 12, that's given in our problem, right? 12 cents or more, and we, then we can say that n can also be 13 because that's higher than 12. And n can also be 14, that's higher than 12 and n can be 15. And we're gonna try to prove for these, okay? So, So we can say that A, we 12 gives you 12. Okay, that's true. We can also form, sorry, my, my internet is a little spotty tonight, but um, I'm gonna try to stay on. If I get kicked off, I will jump back on. We can also form postage of 13 cents using two of the four cents, which gives you eight, right? and one of the five cent stamps. So eight cents plus five cents gives you 13 cents. So that's that works, okay? And then the next thing we can do is we can form postage of 14 cents using one four cents and two five cent stamps. And this is also a good one for like the combinatorics one too, right? So here we have four cents plus two five cents, that's 10. That gives us a total of 14 cents. That works, okay? What about 15? Sure, 15 would work 
that we would have three of the five cent stamps. Okay. What about 16? Do you think 16 can work? Now in 15, 15, we're only using five cent stamp, right? And in 16, we're only going to be using four cent stamp. So we can have four of the four cents, right? That gives you 16 and so forth. So as you can see, anything higher than 12, we can, we can have, you know, both type of stamps or one or the other. So after we had found that these are true, so we can say thus P of N is true for all elements in the base. That would be if we continue with the induction step, let's say that if we want let N is greater than 15, it would not work. So if we go 16 and higher, we would only have four cents, right? Four, four, and then we have to, and then for 17, that might work. So we would continue with the induction step to really check for N is greater than 15 or equal to 15. Now we can say that we would assume P of K is true in the range of 15 through 15, uh, 12 through 15 for K, that the postage of K cents can be formed using four and five cents. That's, this is your induction hypothesis when you make that assumption. Then we would have to state that to form postage of N plus one cents, use the stamps to form the postage of n minus three cents, which exists in the initial the induction hypothesis. Okay, so we had proved that p of n plus one is also true. Okay, so this one takes a little bit longer to write everything out. Okay, and with this, we had gone through the steps to really show right with the base case from 12 to 15. And we state the hypothesis. And we also use our proof from the case to illustrate that it would be true for K plus one or N plus one. Okay, so you kind of see how that would be when we write this out in our exercises. So. Let's go to our assignments now, okay? So the first question, it asks you to provide the definition for mathematical induction principle, mathematic induction principle. And we wanna state that it is a technique to prove specific statement about the natural number very directly and it can be applied in a wide variety of circumstances. Or it is a way of proving mathematical statement by saying if the first case is true, then all the other cases are also true. Okay. And so we have to implement the procedures and you saw the two steps on how to go about applying the mathematical induction principle. Okay, any question with one, you can find that in your notes for the unit. All right. So for number two, let's work through number two and I had written it out. So I'm gonna go through and explain what we have to do for number two, okay? So for number two, it asks you to use induction principle to prove that two to, two to the N is less than factorial of N. For N is greater and equal to four, okay? 
So when you look at this problem, right, what you say is, ah, oh, I am given a base case, right? Just like how we looked at the stamps earlier, it gives you 12 through 15. So in the problem, it usually would tell you where you would start. That would be your base case. So with that, we can start with step one. Step one is to write out your base case, to state your base case. So I would have my base case is n is four, n is equal to four. Once we have that, what we want to do is we want to plug n in to our equation. This is what we're trying to prove, our statement that we're trying to prove. So we're trying to prove this for n is greater and equal to four. So then we would plug that in. So two to the four is gonna give you 16, right? And at this point, we wanna say, is 16 less than four factorial? And when we check four factorial, that's 24. So 16 is less than 24, which makes this true. Okay, so now we want to let n equal to k in the, induct in the inductive step. So in your induction, after you check your base case by plugging it in, you would begin step two. In step two, we would first state that let our n is gonna be equal to k because we have to plug that back into the formula that we saw in the notes. And so because we're using n is four, then we want to apply our also our base case here. So we would have let k is let k is greater and equal to four. Okay, because we just state that n is k, so k is going to be greater and equal to four. And we're gonna make uh, we're gonna state our induction hypothesis or IH by bringing down the statement that's given in the problem, but substitute the n for k in our inductive step. So here, at this point, we would state that assume p of k is true, that is two to the k is less than k factorial, that will be your induction hypothesis. Okay, then we would prove that P of K plus one is also true. So when we plug in K plus one for N, right, right here, then we have two to the k plus one is less than k plus one factorial. And that's what we're trying to prove. Okay. So we started out with this statement. We have a base case. We check that base case by plugging in the value in the math statement here in the equation. Then we start our induction step. We let n is equal to k. And with that, we know that K would start at the base. We created or we state our hypothesis, our IH. After that, we have to prove for K plus one. So P of K plus one needs to be true. We need to prove that. So that means that we would plug K plus one back into the equation that's given. So for every n, we would substitute n with k plus one. Okay, any question?
Okay. So then here is our induction hypothesis, our IH. K, two to the K power is less than K factorial. And just like what we did up here, right? We, we start with four. So you plug in the base value. Two to the four is less than four factorial. That's true. We checked this earlier. So 16 is definitely less than 24. That's correct. Okay. And you can, I multiply this out so you can see just to check. Okay. So now let's say that we multiply both sides by two. Okay. S in if why am I doing that, right? You should say, Dr. Wynn, why are we multiplying by two? Does the two just magically appears? <laughs> no, right? So the logic behind this, the reason behind this is that the reason why we're multiplying by two, and I type this out for you so you can see, because we have k to the, or two to the k plus one, it really is two times two to the k power, okay? And in math, right, you know this when you learn algebra is that if you multiply it by one side, you have to do it by the other side. You've got to have that balance. Okay, so that's why we have to multiply it by both sides. So if you multiply, because this two comes from where? This two comes from the reason that we, uh, we multiply the two is that two times two to the K power, it really is two to the k plus one exponent, okay? Then what we have is we have what? We would multiply two, two times two to the fourth. And we wanna check to see if it's less than two times four factorial. That is true. Okay. And I'm a very visual person when I learn, like I, when I went to college, I highlighted my books and different highlighter. So sorry if the color bothers you, but I tried to show it. So that way you can see like the, the hypothesis and the proof for that. And I was one of those kids that have like multicolor click pan. So I was that student. Um, so I try to use this so you can visually see it, okay? Because we're on Zoom and it's just, it's just harder to kind of show some of this virtually, okay? So do you have any question at this point? I want to be very clear and because, you know, this, sometimes you can get lost in this. And when I was learning this in, in high school and college, it, it took me a little bit to kind of grasp it. So if you're not clear on something, we can go back to the step. Can you explain the why we're doing the two times, why we did the two times? Um, right here? Yeah. Yeah. So just disregard this part, right? Um, the reason why we want to multiply by the two is that when you're looking at two, to the exponent of k plus one, right? If we take that apart piece by piece, it really is two times two to the k because the k plus one means that we have to take the base number, which is two, right? So if you say two to the first power, what is that? That's two, right? And two to the k is two, two to the k, right? So if it's this two, this two right here means it's two to the first like this, okay? And so when you, when you piece it out like that, you're gonna say, oh, well, it's really is that we're multiplying by two to the, two times two to the K. This is equal to this, okay? Because if you take a look at the, the, the equation inside the exponent here is that two to the first is two and two to the K is two to the K. Okay. 
and that's how that that addition operates for the exponent. So as we represent this by multiply it by two on one side, we have to do that on the other side, right? Because there's two sides to this equation, okay? So what you're doing there is you're transitioning from K to K plus one, right? We, we said that in, in induction that if you can prove that's true for K, then you have to prove, then you have to show that it's true for K plus one as well. And what does it mean by k plus one? When we raise it from two to the power, the exponent as k plus one, it's really two times two to the k power. Does that help any questions? Yes, thank you. Uh -huh. So as we multiply that on the left side here, we have to do on the right side, right? Because, you know, like how you would look at the like algebra, right? When we can cancel on both sides if it's the same. So we have to do the same thing on the right side. And when we put we when we plug in four for k, you would see that 32 is less than 48. Okay. Because factorial of, of four. Earlier, we found that that was 24. 24 times 2 gives you 48. So that's still true when we multiply 2 by both sides, right? Good. Then we get to the next step. So we had, we had found a way to incorporate k plus 1 by using this by multiplying by 2. Then next, what we're trying to do is we're trying to say, okay, well, K plus one is larger than two, right? Because if you're looking at how in the sequence, in the position of that, the next value, like if I have the first term as K, right? The next value after that is K plus one, okay? So what we want to do here is we want to say, okay, well, two times K factorial is less than K plus one factorial, okay? So if I plug in the four for K, I would have 32 and I would plug in the four for K on the right side, right? I would have five times four times three times two times one. So this is 20, right? 40, 40 times three, that's 120. So yes, it is smaller. So that's also true. So I have a question. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. 48 or 32 times two. Yeah, so that's 48, that's correct. Okay, thank you. And then on the next one, on the next one here, after we show that K, K plus one is larger than two, then we would then we would take so by definition for factorial right so what factorial is that you would multiply by the k plus one value in subsequent right so i would have i so i would start with k plus one and then multiply it by k and then multiply it by k minus one and so forth and then it's going to go all the way back to one so here is where we would have k plus one times k factorial is equal to k plus one factorial. And this, right, how we're doing this is we're incorporating the factorial law to prove that step, okay? And you would see mathematicians, they when they showing their proof, right, for a certain hypothesis, 
that you have to tie in some of the mathematical law to really show that it is that it is true or it is equal. Okay. So again, we will plug in our base case here for four, four plus one times four factorial is equal to four plus one factorial. And that's also true. So we had showcase through the induction, sorry, there's a fly. Um, the induction step that we had started with N Right, we stated our base case, which is greater and equal to four. Then we stated our hypothesis and we worked through the steps. We showed that we multiply both sides by two and show that it's also true. Then we, all, we implemented the K plus one because we need to show that if it's true for K, then K plus one needs to also be true, okay? So, because k is less than k plus one, we plug that in. We also show, show that it's true. Then we apply the factorial law. And the rule for factorial is that we will multiply k plus one by k factorial is gonna be equal to k plus one factorial. That's true, okay? And when we, we plug in the base value, we show that that is true. So we, we then write our conclusion. Thus, we have proven that our claim, our hypothesis or our claim earlier is true. Our IH is true. Okay. Now I don't do written final exam, but you know, you have, you will have, or you probably took some classes or you currently have, or you will take the classes that's gonna require you to know how to do this. And this is just a tip of the iceberg, right? Um, some of you are taking more advanced math and you've done this in many of your classes, so. And like in some calculus classes, you, you would have four questions on the final and, you know, at UC, and in your math courses, they require that you write all your steps out for your proof um, to show your work. Okay, so this kind of give you some intro or practice with it. Any question? So, what do we take away from all of this, right? After we do all of this. So when you look at that problem, it gives you a lot of the details already, right? Like where do you start and how do you start going from N to K and K to K plus one, okay? So the giveaway from this is because it's using exponent with the base two. So we can see how we need to apply the exponential law to be able to work this out, right? And we show that it's true. Then we apply factorial. By definition for factorial, we show that it's true. I, do, I did include some of the tutorial on the math side in your notes page. So if you have some time, if you wanted to, you know, see some example and such, you can go and then also watch those videos. Question. Okay. So want to try another one in the assignment? That's what all we're going to probably be doing for the rest of the time. And then we're going to touch a little bit on recursion where we're gonna go to the previous number because Fibonacci is about looking at the two prior numbers and get the sum. Or you might've seen Lucas number too. Okay, so let's look at number three. I'll pull this up and then we'll move, we'll scroll down a little bit more because it tends to be a little lengthy. Um, it tells you to use induction step to prove three to the n minus one is multiple of two for n is greater than one. 
So here again, we in our problem statement, we have our base value. Okay. So we would start with the base case. N is equal to one. Okay, so that's gonna be the value that we're gonna use to plug in when we test these things, right? So then we would plug in one for N, so three to the first minus one is gonna give you two. And if you wanna test the next value for two, you can, because it says N is greater than and equal to one. So if I plug in the two to the second power, that's gonna give me eight. So nine subtract one is eight. So we have the first step down, then we move to the second step of our induction. So af right after that, you need to state let n is equal to k, right? Now we want to transition to for every n, it's gonna be equal to k. And then we would again, change that to k plus one and show that to show the proof. So we have let n is equal to k, so we know that from here, we know that k is gonna be greater and equal to one, okay? Then we will state our hypothesis and you simply bring down the equation and the problem statement. It says, assume that p of k is true, that is three to the k power minus one results, an even number or a number that is multiple of two. Or you can say that the number that's gonna divide it by two with zero remainder, it's the same thing. Okay. And we want to prove for P of K plus one is true. That is three to the K plus one minus one also results in even number or a number that's multiple of two. Any questions so far as far as the beginning of step two in number three? Then we simply take the equation, right? Three to the K minus one. And we plug in the base value, which gives you true, right? Two is an even number, so that's correct. Sure, yes, true. It's not an odd number, it's an even number. So we have that true. Okay. Then we need to test it for K plus one using the base value. Okay, so when we plug in for K, we have S one, so three to the two plus one, that's the second, that's nine, right? Three to the second is gonna give you nine, minus one is gonna give you eight. Is it gonna be equal to three times three to the K minus one? Okay, is that true? Yes, that's true, eight is gonna be equal to eight. And we established this already, right? From the last exercise we talk about, you know, when you have a base value to the exponent of K plus one, it's really itself times, right? To the K power. So that's also true.
So now we can continue by looking at this. So we, we had left off with three to the K plus one minus one, which is the left side. We wanted to see if it is multiple of two. It's gonna give you an even number, right? Because when you have an even number, uh, when you multiply it by two, you're gonna con you're gonna be able to yield, right? Also an even. So if you have two times three k plus three k minus one, because where is that the first part come from? It's multiple of two. It tells you that in the problem statement, and we want to continue from the previous term. So to continue from the previous term, that's gonna be 3K plus 3K minus one. And that's also gonna give us true. So eight is gonna be equal to eight. Then at this point now, right, we show that it's true for K, it's true for K plus one. Then we show that our claim is true. This is gonna lead us into next week where we work, we go the other way, right? We're gonna look at the prior number in recursion. We're gonna talk a little bit about that today and then you're gonna look at the relationship between one number and the next number and the next one. So, um, so here, what we're doing is we're looking at the statement and when you are trying to program, what you also do is you look at the problem statement, right? We talked about implementing the algorithm, but what can you work with? What type of conditions can you work with to really give you the, prop the output that you expect? Okay, so in this case, what we show is we show that we can work with the variable and the subsequent variable or the value from, from that's gonna be subsequent to that. Okay, any question? All right. Uh, some of you type this and hold on one second. Let Good, we have proved that the base three would result in the odd number. Therefore we subtract by one, then we get an even. Yes, because if you only have the base three, then you would get the odd number. You can go that way too. So Albert asks, instead of doing it this way, can, can he show that just using the base three to the K, right? Uh, like three to the K power without subtracting one is gonna give you the odd. So when you subtract, but you have to be able to illustrate that on both sides. So it yields it right accordingly. And yeah, there are many ways that you can prove using mathematical laws, sure, right? You can have different mathematicians in a room and they would write out some of the proof a little bit differently, okay? All right, question. Okay. So let me touch back on the notes a little bit to make sure that we cover all the things that we need to talk about. Um, so there's some example that for, you know, Bernoulli's inequality principle, 
Um, there's additional example that you can also take a look at on how they write it out. I didn't like how this was presented because it was presented more of an explanation than actually incorporating the steps on how you would do inductive reasoning. Um, you know, and in some cases you would see that with induction, sometimes you would have strong induction and sometimes you would have weak induction. So, um, you know, the choice in like going back to Albert's question, the choice in how you, you show that is really going to show, you know, in one extent or the other. And if you have further questions about exponent and how we can take a look at the exponent, like, you know, two times two to the K and it is that equal to two to the K plus one, it shows you that on page four of your notes here. Okay, in that example as well. And then also the even number, we just worked on that. And, you know, you you probably asked, where is that two coming from, Dr. Wen? <laughs> yeah, so when, when that would be like two times N. So you can also show, it's also show how that works on the bottom of that page. Because they have to show the inequality um, with that number system, so. Okay, now you know that 50% of this class is about applying this to programming. So I'm, I'm not really, you know, it's not a full 100% math course where, you know, you go through a lot of the details in math. What I want to do, what the way I wanted to really incorporate this, this content for you is just, you know, how can you apply this for job purposes, right? Like, how can you make it you know, um, the, the concept and be applying this concept into your output, which is your program. And that's, that's important to me because that's really when you start to see the application that's gonna take effect. Because most of the majority of you are computer science major and that's what you're gonna be doing, right? Like seeing it and be able to, you know, solve the problem mathematically and then write the program. So um, we touched a lot on recursion in the last few weeks when we look at the example program. So um, unlike last semester or the prior semester when I did this, I started the semester a little bit stronger with recursion. So it's not like unfamiliar to you because I seen that students struggle in this area. Like when, when they're asked to write a recursive function or they're asked to write a program that has recursion, they struggle in it in all my programming classes. So what I want you to take away from this class is to really see, right, how that, you know, the, the math piece and how that can tie into your, your C++ programming, okay? So we talked about how that, you know, what a runtime would be. Um, and, and for the runtime, all your procedures, especially if you're looking at like a sorting program, we talked we talked about search and sort already. It would we would have to take a look at the analysis that's going to give us the performance, right? The 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 time complexity in how that program is going to be measured um, in performance. So the recurrence is really applying the mathematical formula that specify the runtime of the algorithm in the elements of N. So outside of the math concept, we have to look at how that run, that algorithm is gonna give us the runtime for each of, for the input, right? So when you're looking at the input that could be elements in an array, that could be an elements in vector, that could be elements in your container, right? It, and there's so many different types of container we can implement. Um, so your T of N 
is going to be really determined on right it's going to it's going to be impacted by the algorithm and the number of inputs that you have okay and this is when when you're looking at cryptography or when you're looking at things that that is time sensitive algorithm matters right when you're looking at crunching data looking at data analysis stuff like that algorithm matters okay so so one can differ than the other and that can tell us how the the efficiency level of that program compared to the next program so here it tells you that yes um, when you were looking at merge sort merge sort usually you would see it written with recursive call and where the elements would then so the first and the second half does how it would be able to really look at the first half of that list or that container compared to the second half of that list or set of the, inside that container for the number of the elements because we first have to break it into halves and halves and halves and then we have to merge it back okay so the merge when it merges it's really going to look at when we do a merge sort it's going to sort it by subgroup by merging the subgroup back into a larger group so that way we would have to use recursive call okay so what does that mean we have to take a look at the previous value or the previous state right of that subgroup okay and it's going to build on that it will continue to so when you have a recursive function it's calling on itself right so your output is really built on the previous output and so forth okay and we did touch on how why you know sometimes recurse re, using recursion can create issues okay in for for us in the in the programming okay so with that what you have is the first step is that we need to break that list into half or that that container into half and then we would keep doing that so that way it would get to a very small portion where we can sort it. We can re reorganize it from a low to high, right? Ascending order. So in step two, what it needs to do, it needs to take a look at the N operations required to merge the two groups together based on the total size. So really this is a length, the length of your, of your array, the, the length of your input, the number of your input. So does that matter? Sure, right? When, when we're looking at a thousand elements, that's different than 10 elements. Or when we're looking at a million elements, then that number of input is drastically higher than when you have a tiny array of 10 elements, okay? So with that, <clears throat> we can see that with the merge sort, the t of n is really two times t of n plus n or t or n divided by two plus n okay now when we solve the recurrence it's you know the author she showed that when you you would take this right and then so we have t of n is n plus two times t times n divided by two that's what we start with okay and then what we do is we would distribute the two and at this point here after that we would add up the like term which gives you 2n right the n plus the n gives you 2n and then we would use associated law and distributive law to solve for the last half of this. Okay. So basically you take that formula or that equation and you would apply it 
looking at the recursion. I, uh, the way I look at this, you know, from the programming side, it's, it's just a little confusing for me, right? So I asked myself like, oh, what would the student want to see? Okay. So after all of this, what you want to conclude is that how can we derive n from n minus one? Okay, because if your input, let's say I have one, two, three, four, five, right? I'm out of order and I want to be able to merge and sort it, what I need to do is cut that list down in half, but we have to build our list from the prior sublist. Right, so the hierarchy, the way it goes is that we have to start from the bottom, build it up, sort it, and then sort it again. So you have to be able to derive n from n minus one, okay? Big picture. So let's answer some question. Define recurrence for number four. It's a relay, it's an equation that expresses each element in the sequence as a function of the preceding ones. Just to simplify it, because there are many ways that people define this, right? And recursive function is one that call itself. So a recurrence relation is an equation that expresses each element of the sequence as a function of the preceding one. So it has to obtain the result in order to be able to build the next one and the next one from the previous in order to build the next one and so forth. Okay, all right. So let's look at the values and see what we can do with this. We already talked about sequence last week. So, you know, this should look very familiar to you already. Okay. Let's look at the recurrence relation for the initial conditions in this sequence. Okay. So we know that in the question, it tells you that there, you know, we have to find the recurrence relation. And so I just put in the notes here that the recurrence relation tells you how to get from the previous term to the future terms. Okay. Like how I would get to five from one, right? Remember, we talked about the differences with arithmetic or the common ratio, right, with geometric last time. Okay, so we have to take a look at the relationship between these numbers, but the way we look at it is from the previous value. So I made a table and then I type out the notes for you. And you don't have to put it down verbatim as long as you understand it, then that's good enough for me, okay? So what you have is our term one, the first term, term one is one, term two is five, 17, 53, 161, and so forth. That's what's given here, right? So we would take these and what we would do is we would find the difference between one and the other, okay? So if we take five, we subtract one, we get a four. 17 subtract five, we get a 12. 53 subtract 17, we get a 36. 161 subtract 53, we get a 108. 485 subtract 161, we get 324 first level difference. Okay, so looking at that, what we need to do is we need to first determine the difference between, between one number and the next for that, for that set. Okay, then the next step is to determine the common factor. Okay by looking at the differences. 
so here I get from four to, to 12 by multiplying by three to four, right? So I take four times three, I get a 12. Okay, 12 times three, I get a 36. 36 times three, I get a 108. Going back, right? The important things that you need to really see is that we need to see the recurrence relation. What, what can we do with the prior number to get to the next? So we would take four times three, 12 times three, 36 times three to get to the next one and 108 times three and so forth, okay? So you have your common factor there, three. So once we have the common factor, right, of three, going back and we would look at the original sequence, is there something there for us? Okay, so here what we have is, so if you take a look at 4, 12, 36, 108, we already know that, yeah, we draw out the three as a common factor. Will this work with the first one? Okay, so now let's say that I start with one, I multiply it by three, I get three. Okay, and from three to five, that's a plus two. Okay, then I take a five, the next number I multiply by three, I get a 15, 15 plus two gets 17. Okay, so after I multiply it by the common factor for each of the value, I have to add it, I have to plus two to that to get to the next value. So you do see some, some relationship there, okay? So here I state that it appears that it's two less than the next term after we multiply the common factor. Okay, everybody follow so far, any question? Then what we can do is Remember our arithmetic progression from last time, right? So based on this, what you can draw is that we can say, oh, I simply would take the previous value, which is one here, times it by three, plus it with two to get the five. And the same thing again, five times three plus two, 17. 17 times three plus two, 53 and so forth. So with that, we can simply create our recursion equation. A of n is equal to three times a, uh, a of n minus one plus two. And this is your equation, okay? And you can test it, plug in one. Okay, you get a, the five, plug in five, you get 17 and so forth. Okay. Any question? So in future quiz and tests, it would look something like this, right? It would give you the sequence and then you're asked to select the proper equation that would represent the relationship for that, re re that sequence recursively. Anything on number five? All right, let's take a look at number six.
It says use recurrence relation concept to check that A of N is two to the N plus one is the solution to the recurrence relation A of N is two times A of N minus one minus one with A is three. And just, we just did induction. So you, you, you see some of, you know, some of the things coming up here. You got a base, right? You got, they give you the, the equations to work with. And in the prior week, what we did was we simply start with the first term and then moving forward, okay? So what I did was I took the first equation, A of N is equal to two times N plus one. I wanted to show that this, right, is gonna yield a certain value and each of the subsequent value from the first, like the second term is built on the first term and so forth. And that's why we need to have the second equation to show that, okay? Okay, so I take the first equation, I plug in the N starting with N as one. So A of one is two to the first plus one gives me three. A of two, two to the second plus one gives me five. A of three, two to the third plus one gives me nine. A four, two to the fourth plus one gives me 17. So that would be the first step. Plug in the N value starting at one. And we know that the first one is three, it gave us there, so that's three. Right, then five, nine, 17. Then we need to build on the, subs the previous value to obtain the next using the recursion equation. So I would take the second equation, which shows the recursion. How do you know that? It shows n minus one, okay? So a of n is two times a of n minus one minus one. We start with a of one is three. Then you would plug in for a of two, two times three minus one, which is five right? Plug in here. So where did I get the three from? Well, it's the previous number. So because it's n minus one, I put the three there. Minus the one gives me five. Then I would continue. A of three is two times the previous number, which is five. Five minus one gives me nine. And then you can test for four if you want. So I put dot, dot, dot. So we can state that A of N is two to the N plus one is the solution for the recurrence relation A of N, is, you know, this equation where A is, A1 is three. Okay, so just to recapture all the stuff that we went through. First, you would take the A of N equation, plug in the N value to give you the sequence. Once you have that, you wanna test that sequence by using the second equation and see the relationship from the value based on the previous value in that sequence. Okay. And if that's true, then we would state that yes, there is a recurrence relation. And this is number six, okay. Any question?
Okay. All right, so let's look at number seven. If you don't have any question on six. Okay, for seven, it tells you to solve the recurrence relation a of n is a of n minus one plus n with the initial term a of zero is a four. Okay, so we start at four. So we have a of zero is four, then a of one is four plus one, right? Because here it tells me that I would take the previous value and plus the n value. So I get a five. Then I move to a of two. So I would take the five from the previous term. I would plus a two because we're plusing n, we get a seven. Then for a of three, I would take the seven from the previous term, right? I plus the n, which is three, gives me 10. Okay. And if you like, you can continue there. So I just put dot, dot, dot. Then what I do is I look at the difference in the term, like what you've seen earlier in the earlier exercise where I have the table, right? Now we're gonna look at the difference in term. I would take a of one minus a of zero, I get a one. A of two minus a of one, I get a two. A of three minus a of two, I get a three. You start to see a pattern here right? So when we'll look at the difference, the difference of the difference is one. The second level difference of each is plus one. The distance of it is one. Because it's going to go one, two, three, four, five, six, and so forth. Any question? So after we had plug in the n value, right, in our equation, then we would get the sequence value and we would find a difference between the two from one to the next. Okay. Sorry, I drop it onto the next page there because why did it do that? Let me see. Let me move it back up. I don't know why it came, it went to the next page. Okay. So in the next step, <clears throat> what I what I concluded from the second part here in the difference is that I said, oh, well. A of n minus A of n minus one is n, right? Because you see one, two, three, four, five, and so forth. Now, if you see that, then when we, when we get the difference and we sum it up, okay, you would have one plus two plus three plus four plus five plus n. Right. Then you would have A of N is, we substitute in the N, N times N plus one divided by two plus A of zero, which is four. Hold on one second. Let me grab something real quick. Let me put this here so you can see. 
Okay. So we simply say that n times n plus one divided by two plus a of zero is going to be a of n. Okay. Any question? Actually, I want to leave it like that. Okay, did we get this part? Any question on that? No question on that? Okay, so now the last part. So I found the difference. I state that the difference is n, right? And then I rewrite this using n and a of zero. Then I test it. So for a of zero is four, a of one is n times n plus one divided by two plus four, which gives me five and that checks true. So I conclude that solution for the recurrence relation subject to the conditional, the initial condition is that A of n is n times n plus one divided by two plus four. Okay, so you can take that equation and then you can, you know, in programming in C++, right? There's no little sub A of N minus one. You have to translate that to N, which is your input, right? A variable that could possibly hold element value or, you know, some form of input, okay? So now at this point, we can take this and we can implement it in our program. But this shows you the step on show on, on uh, displaying or proving the relationship between previous value and the next in a sequence. Okay. Now with this, when we program it, what we can do is we can use it to generate, right? Could be a, you know, a longer sequence, right? Like it could go on for a long time or we can implement some form of loop just to plug in specific value or have the user input and so forth. Okay, so we can definitely have a constructed program at this point. Any question? No question? All right, so I expect everybody to know how to write recursion program then. Okay, so um, like I mentioned earlier, if you didn't catch that, we're gonna do Fibonacci, okay? Um, I will open the lab possibly by tomorrow. So there's a little fun video that I always include from TED Talk and it talks about Fibonacci and, you know, um, the golden number, you know, how some of this, like when, and when you're looking at Fibonacci, it's also, you can see that not just in nature, but in other type of numbers as well, which is really cool. Um, and Fibonacci, you can see this in like sunflower and we'll talk a little bit about that in the lab. Um, in seashells, that's why in discrete structure class, you often see like shells or, you know, stuff like that. 
is shown on the cover page because at one point or another we have to address Fibonacci and see see how that's applied. Okay, so this will be a perfect time for that using recursion. Okay, and some of you had me for CIS 11, you wrote that in assembly. So now we'll take a look at it in C++. All right, any question? So I'll stay on for questions. If you have questions, um, please go through the notes. I didn't use too many of the example from the notes. I just figure if I go through this and show you the steps, it's gonna be more clear as you do it. Okay. And then I'll fix the, the extra credit. I know one of the questions have issues, so I'll work on that and make sure that's corrected. Okay, so don't forget quiz and extra credit this week. Um, and if you didn't get the homework submitted, make sure you send that in. I will try to get all your grade updated because I have my non-credit class that goes for four weeks each. Um, I just finished the second one, so I got to wrap up that grade, but I will try to get all your grade updated, hopefully before the end of the week. Okay. All right. Any questions? Okay, type your name into the chat so I can add attendance after the class. Um, and I hope you enjoy the evening. I'll stay on for a little while in case you have questions, if you miss something at the beginning. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you, good night. Uh, you too, bye. Oh, hi, Professor Yuka here. I still yes, have a yes. question about the uh, extra credit and quiz. Mm -hmm. The first uh, in a vector that contains uh, 720 elements, the one, uh, they both have uh, different answers. For the extra credit, the answer is uh, nine, and I remember on the quiz. A vector that contains 720 elements, how many comparison must be performed for the binary? It should be okay. 9.4 or uh, something like that. And yeah, uh, so uh, you need to round off. You need to probably round off on that. Yeah, so uh, um, the extra credit is should be nine. I think it's because it's nine point mm -hmm. four nine, so yeah. it should be uh, nine. But on the quiz, the correct answer is ten. Let me see. Yeah, I think I originally had it at ten last semester, and one of the student had stated. Well, he, he had a good argument with this and he said, well, why, you know, why are you rounding down? Because there's expectation, it's, you should expect it in worst case scenario. And when you round it down, you're not putting it in worst case scenario and he's valid, right? Um, so, and I intended for it to be nine originally when, when, when I wrote that question, okay? Just like how we've been practicing with, with our assignments. Um, but when he stated that, I think I had recorrected the quiz because uh, the argument is that when you have, let's say nine point something, right? Like 9.1 something, really, wouldn't you estimate it to be higher than nine? Because if you shave off the decimal point, you're not putting it in the worst case scenario because it's actually higher than nine. Yeah, so, um, what I would want to do, let me double check the quiz right now. I think I wanted to keep that answer because it's a valid argument um, as far as the quiz go. And then what I'll do is I will, so as you attempted it, it already keep, if you answer that correctly on the, on the review game, it will keep that score. But the people that, that will do it following 
right? Like after I updated it, they will have to answer it like how it's probably should be answered. So, okay. yeah. So I think, um, let me double check on the quiz right now since I have you online. Yeah, so let me see, that was this question right here. Yeah, so I, I did modify this because I originally had it as nine. So um, did you, so it ding you wrong for the quiz attempt? Is that what you're telling me, right? Uh, yes, yes. Okay, and that was your first attempt? Uh, right. I, the first attempt, I, I choose nine. The second uh -huh. attempt, I, I choose 10. So. Oh, so you got it correct. Yeah. So that's fine. Um, I will supplement some of, you know, for extra credit down the line that you caught that. But, you know, my argument for this is I think that the student's point from last semester is valid. I, I really think that you know, he did spend the time to evaluate this. And I talked to some of my colleagues and they feel the same way, too. So. Um, yeah, so you need to round it up, not down, because if we round it down, we we actually, we don't estimate the program performance as it should be. Um, because in the case where if you have larger input, you know, if you round it down, you're actually shaving off the time where your expectation should be higher in the worst case scenario. Okay, so okay, yeah, choose 10, sense. choose 10. <laughs> And there's okay. one more uh, arrows uh, is the at on the extra credit uh, mm -hmm. at restaurant there are hamburger hot dog and pizza sandwich that one yeah so and then six types of soft drink right. so you have five, uh, five or six food yeah so you have one two three four Your five five six six and then six drinks and you decided to get an item of food Wait, a and a sandwich or it's a pizza and sandwich yeah so, so yeah I, I i know they they brought this up last time too so i think i forgot a comma there so you have you have so um how many total combinations of choice would you select from yeah 36. it's actually yeah it's actually a separate it's pizza comma sandwich <laughs> yeah so i i will fix that it's a typo thing right and some student they interpret that as a a pizza sandwich like you know like one thing <laughs> right i'm but, just confused <laughs> yeah so that's so i see that yeah that should be six six food and six drinks that was my intention <laughs> Okay. okay. I will fix a typo on that. No problem. Other questions? So that question and the vector question. Okay, so since you guys don't have any questions, I'm gonna stop the recording so the video is not super lengthy, but yeah, I'm gonna be on for a little bit in case you have questions. <laughs> 